Well, welcome everybody. Uh, over 70 uh, now tuned in to the Radio Club of America interview series. Uh, we have on with us tonight uh, our two moderators, Barney Scholl, who is our um, Vice President Counsel for the Radio Club of America, and also Scott Jones. And uh, Scott and I work together at DX Engineering. And our very special guest is Margaret Lyons. And uh, Margaret, uh, why don't you tell, start off by telling uh, just uh, some of your background uh, concerning the Radio Club of America and uh, how, you, how you got involved, how, you, how did you learn about the Radio Club and uh, take us through the timeline of your involvement with RCA. All right, so I learned about the Radio Club of America at work. At the time, I was with RCC Consultants. Uh, the, at that company, the president and CEO, Mike Hunter, he was a one-time winner of the Fred Link Award, and I'm sure he knew Fred Link personally over the years. Uh, but he and other uh, members of staff used to go to the banquet, and they didn't really call it the tech symposium then, but that afternoon there was always a talk. And uh, they kept saying, you should come with us. You should join this. You need to, to be a part of this. And so I went to a couple of banquets and became more involved. And how did I get on the board? The nominations committee, um, a couple of members worked at RCC and they came knocking on my door and said, we want you to run for secretary. And when was that, Margaret? Uh, that I probably joined in the late 90s and first ran for secretary um, 2008 or so. Okay, all right. So um, you've been uh, a long, long time officer uh, of the club. Um, yes. what, would, what would you say is, um, uh, what has changed in the time that you've been associated with RCA? What, what, have, what have you seen transition uh, through the time you've been a member? Well, I, starting with that tech symposium, which we just had, was it two weeks ago, which is, is really grown into something so much bigger than, oh, let's have a little technical talk in the afternoon. Um, I know that I'll say the first one that I remember, people don't talk about this one so much, was in DC for the 100th anniversary. Maybe we thought that was gonna be a one-off and then it really got going down in Texas. So 2009 to 2011. And really since then, it's, it's been fantastic. Yeah, they, uh, those events that were spurred by the 100th anniversary, and of course, the Radio Club of America was formed in 1909. It is the oldest wireless club in the world. And uh, so uh, for the 100th year celebration, which was 2009, what Margaret's talking about here, we were in Washington, D.C., and then, Margaret, you attended the, the banquet in Texas. And yes. How about Florida? Oh, yes. And I, then I, I probably haven't missed one in 20 years and more. Yeah. Right. And, of course, um, the Radio Club, I, I see one of the questions is, uh, what is the Radio Club all about? The Radio Club is made up of professional people that are – um, involved in wireless and communications um, parts of the industry. Um, may, maybe, Margaret, you can give a, an even better definition to what is the radio club? I, it's hard to give a better definition than a past president just gave, but it is for people who are interested in any of the facets of the art and science of, of wireless, whether it be, uh, we've had people involved in medical devices, military, satellite, broadcast TV or radio, because that's all wireless. Um, land mobile radio, the, um, whether it's private systems and the first responders or the commercial services like I'm taking advantage of right now on my phone. So everything and, and hobbyists. How can yes. I forget obvious? Right. <laughs> the amateur radio. We have we have a big a big group of amateur radio. And of, and of course that the, the founders of the Radio Club of America were amateur radio operators. And uh, and that was at the, at the beginning of wireless. And, uh, and of course they went on to uh, uh, bigger and, and better things as well as as time went on. Uh, Margaret, let's talk about um, 
how you became interested. When did this happen? Was it in high school? Was it in college that you decided that you would pursue engineering as your oh, passion? Yeah. So I decided that in high school, um, did well in math and science. What are you going to do? What are you going to study with that math and science bent? And uh, my father had recommended engineering. He thought that would be a good fit for me. Um, he also thought computers were an up and coming thing. And I really ought to tie that in somehow. Um, <laughs> this is before PCs. It was a while back. Um, so I wound up not sure. Did I want to study chemical engineering, electrical engineering, um, freshman chemistry? I decided electrical was for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what that's what pushed you towards that. Now, was your father or uh, anybody in your family or a friend um, in in the electrical engineering, um, you know, involved in anything electrical engineering? Did you have a mentor? Um, at, at several levels. So I had an uncle who's an electrician, um, and he had learned his trade in the Navy. Uh, we just had what uh, yesterday was um, Pearl Harbor Day. That was what prompted him to join the Navy. He was 16 turning 17, so he was right off and he had his electrical training there. I wonder in a different age if he would have gone to college and gotten a degree. So as a kid with science fair projects, I was doing things with transistors and building circuits. Uh, my father had studied engineering, but then he went off to World War II when he came back, he studied um, business. So I used to tease him. He took engineering as pre-business, but he didn't have a calculator. I'm sure it was much tougher then. Right, right. So he, he was uh, slide rule. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just all, all computational, none of the fun of solving a problem, all the, the grit and grind. So um, you grew up in New Jersey and you decide to um, go to the University of Scranton. Yes. All right, so, so how did that work out and why did you pick that school? And um, I had never been away from home before. I didn't want to go to um, Rutgers State University in New Jersey, a very good school, about 10 miles from home. And my sister had done that. We as a family would take a trips and just drop in on her. I didn't want that for my college experience. So Scranton was like two, three hours away. They could still come see me, but it wasn't going to be a surprise. Again, no cell phones back then. You maybe had one telephone on the whole floor in a dorm. So you did just surprise people back then. Um, and I liked the campus visit. It was a small uh, university about the size of my high school. So wasn't too intimidating. And they gave me very good scholarships. Uh, my recollection is freshman year cost about $150, which for a <laughs> private school, even back then, that was very good. That's very good. So, so why did you leave the University of Scranton? Oh, right. Um, it's not a bad accredited for their engineering degree. Um, and, you know, once I really settled in electrical engineering, this is, you know, where I want to move forward. I've had some experience away from home with college. Um, that was the thing to do for me, I felt, in, in building my future was to transfer to um, a school that did have that strong electrical engineering uh, program. And I was lucky enough, I have cousins who were high school guidance counselors. And so they helped me look at what schools might be a good fit for me. And I was looking at, oh, MIT and Purdue. MIT was fabulously expensive. <laughs> Purdue, not so bad. And I had relatives who lived in Indianapolis. So even though I was going much farther from home, I still had people, you know? Right, right. You know? It's, it's good to have uh, people just in case. Well, that, <laughs> and, you know, you, when you're away at college and, you know, it's tough. You're studying and everything else. You need that. I got to go home for the weekend, walk the dog. I could do that. You know, they right. were an hour away. I could have that weekend, just take a break from it all. So you graduate from Purdue. And uh, do you sit for your PE, your first PE exam at that point? Or when do you become a professional engineer? Okay, so I graduate, uh, I move home, interview, wind up at this little startup firm, RCC Consultants. And um, 
PEs are rare, especially then in wireless communications, in radio. You know, usually they're in power and building bridges and these other things. But we did a lot of work with public safeties and governments and on their requests, they want to see engineers who are PEs. So Mike Hunter had put a bounty on people getting their PEs and you would get a $10,000 raise if you got your PE. I can be bought. <laughs> so I said, I can do that. <laughs> and uh, so there's a couple steps you, you take a they used to call it the EIT. Now it's the fundamentals of engineering. So you take a first broad exam and you need four years experience and then you take the PE exam. Right. Now you've sat for multiple PE exams, right? I yep. passed it on the first try. No, 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 no. I don't mean that in multiple <laughs> states. Oh, um, they, they do reciprocity between states. Okay. So yeah. that's how you're, you're actually licensed in how many states? Six states. Six states, okay. But so you don't have to sit for the exam in those other states. No, no. All right, good. But uh, yeah, one, it only <laughs> took one sitting for you to yeah. do, knock it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's great. I'm an A student. I was got scholarships. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that, uh, see, the, the issue that some of us had is that we had this ham radio fascination and, and uh, you know, at Penn State, we had a great ham radio club and uh, many of us amateur radio operators struggled with uh, with our grades as a result of the <laughs> <laughs> spending too much time on the ham radio on campus. But uh, so, but you're around wireless. It, it's not a hobby for you though, it, but you're definitely extremely passionate about, uh, you know, you know, your course of study and then the fact that you jump right in at, at RCC. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, I guess that's my nature. I jump right in with both feet. I'm a joiner and a doer, which is odd because I consider myself an introvert, classic engineer introvert. And in part, I thought that RCC, a consulting company, would be good for me because I wouldn't be alone in a corner with a computer. Hello, coronavirus. I'm home alone in a corner with a computer. <laughs> but <laughs> it, that was a long time ago. Right. But, but you did, uh, you mentioned to me at one time that you did kind of hang out around the, uh, the university uh, radio station. So at, at Purdue in the 80s, um, there was the um, residence hall network. So several of what at one time were men's only dorms, obviously the one I lived in wasn't at that point, um, had studios for the campus, it was on the wire, and occasionally different reasons you could go out on the air. I never went out on the air, but when you came home after a party or a dance or being out at the bar, again, Purdue in the 1980s, you couldn't go directly into the girls' wing because that would be unsafe. You had to enter through the men's side and sign in to get past the guards to get to the women's side. But right there was the studio for the well, really our dorm radio that was part of the campus network. And so there were always people there, whatever time you got home and, you know, you're all awake and wound up and so are they. And, you you know, interesting people in radio, lots of good conversations and pulling big record albums out. What have you heard and what's new? And it was, you know, I made a bunch of friends just from that little section of life, that slight section of life. So tell us about your career with RCC. Uh, as a consultant, uh, some of the projects, your responsibilities. What did you do there, Margaret? Um, I mentioned that when I joined them, it was a startup. There were seven employees when I got there. So you do everything <laughs> when, when it's that small. There is no, this is your job, this is my job, I including as, as most companies now, uh, you know, anybody who drinks coffee makes coffee. I lived nearby. I would get there first on a snowy day, tried to make coffee, which I don't drink. They told me I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> Apparently that's not a skill. <laughs> but um, so I was this junior right out of school person and I had computer and electrical engineering. So I was hired to program and run the computer and also be that help for the engineers doing any of the different projects, filling out FCC forms, um, 
So RCC, RAM Communications Consultants, was the engineering arm for RAM broadcasting. So we filled out FCC forms for public safety clients and for the common carrier clients for um, IMTS, if you remember that before cellular, <laughs> IMTS and paging. So I worked on those types of systems. My cities were along the front range in Colorado and out in Seattle and Bellevue. So I would early on start to learn to design those paging systems. And like I said, program the computer, we had a TRS-80 and then we got an HP <laughs> computer before we dabbled into these new fangled things called PCs. Yeah. So, um, so how long do you stay with RCC? I was with RCC 29 years, just a little while. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so it That's had grown. A good run. It, it it was a good run. Yes, it had grown really big, and right at the end, um, I was there through the the buyout from uh, Black and Beach bought RCC. Okay, and so uh, do you continue on with Black and Beach, or what happens? Um, that process it it was a uh, you know a big change and a turning point, and I went from employee number something like seven to something like 70,000 and seven. So I, writing on the wall, I said, this is a time for a change for me. And I really, the day Black and Beach came in, I handed in my resignation for four weeks and I went to a, another smaller consulting firm, VCOM, also based out of New Jersey. Okay, and so what, what are you doing at VCOM now? So VCOM, no, so now I'm an engineer with, 30 years experience. Right? Right. So they brought me in as, as a director and I worked, uh, again, public safety projects. Um, here in New Jersey, the local biggies like New York City Transit and Port Authority, New York, New Jersey, and even my friends down in the city of Philadelphia, once they've worked with you and if, if it works well, they don't like to let go. So it's really a lot of the same people and the same projects there. But also, I worked with the support for Verizon in uh, zoning for cell towers. So I was now, I had dabbled in that a little at RCC when we built the nationwide mobile data network, RAM mobile data, Mobitex. Uh, but now this was a, a much a bigger pursuit at, at VCOM, did a lot of uh, zoning hearings. So where are you now? Now I'm with Jacobs Engineering. Um, so you know, economics, different things. Um, a couple of years ago, you know, we, we had a separation from VCOM, but VCOM was a sub to Jacobs on a New York City transit project. And the Jacobs guy said, oh, come work for us. <laughs> so, so we worked that out. And now I'm, again, same projects, rebranded. Now I work for the Jacobs and uh, working with New York City transit and Port Authority and you know, we, we bid down in the Philadelphia area. I don't, I guess right now we've got work with um, DRPA, PATCO. Um, yeah, down like that. Okay, well, that's good. It, it, that's quite a run and, uh, you know, a, a couple of different companies, but it's, it seems like you've always landed on your feet and, uh, yeah. and you've taken your passion with you. Let's, let's get into some of the questions um, that uh, came in through the chat room. If you have any questions, uh, we're on here uh, tonight with Margaret Lyons. Uh, Margaret is a longtime uh, engineer, uh, both in electrical engineering and computer engineering. And uh, she is also a longtime uh, secretary of the Radio Club of America. So Scott and, and Barney, if you want to, uh, let's uh, start with the uh, question. Scott, if you want to kick it off. Okay, and uh, if you can, you can hear me all right, yes. The, if uh, anybody has any questions, please put them in either the chat room or in the Q&A area, and we will try to get to as many as we can this evening. Hopefully, uh, uh, you have some good questions for Margaret. Uh, Margaret, what would, your wor what would be your words of encouragement to young women and their following a like career path? Did you have any hurdles to overcome, any kind of, uh, any kind of guidance you might provide there? You know, it's hard to really notice, right? I only know my own experience. So it's hard to know what might've been harder for me than for someone else. And um, 
also looking back, I, I have a warm glow of history. So I don't have any particular horror stories. You know, I might have funny stories here and there where early on when we're someone who's in accounting asks me, oh, my daughter is thinking of going into engineering. Is that really for girls? And I think, well, yeah. <laughs> so um, study hard, stick with it. I think some of the challenges are the same, whether you're a female or a male. It's, it's not an easy curriculum. You are learning to learn and think through and push through. But if you have the interest, you'll stick with it. It's worth it. You make a nice living, you meet nice people, you do interesting things. You know, different times when you read out there, people who are searching for jobs and they don't know what they wanna do or they hate what they do. I, I can't imagine hating engineering. You know, if that's your app, what your aptitude is for, you will enjoy what you do. And, and it's clear that you still have the passion I think you probably had when you, uh, the first day you walked in as uh, employee number seven, you know, and said, hey, let's go do this. And yeah. so it's that's, fun. that's very, very yeah. cool. Barney, an another question for Margaret. Somewhat following us along the same lines. What do you think that schools, corporations, and I'll even add RCA, the Radio Club of America, can do to help increase the number of students, especially young women, who enter STEM fields? Um. You know, I think a lot of it, it seems, is visibility. And um, with my local group in New Jersey, the IEEE, we talk about telling the story, which is what Tim is doing here and has been building now this fall. Telling the stories, it really helps. If people don't know it's a choice and don't know that it's interesting and don't know you can make a living, you know, you can support a family then they're not gonna choose those fields and they're not gonna know about it. Um, so I, I think that's a lot of it is, is being visible, telling the stories and, and letting people know that engineering is out there and there's all kinds of interesting things you can do. Uh, Scott, another question for Margaret. Um, I had a question that um, came up in the chat room that people were asking, uh, the TRS-80 brings back obviously a lot of um, interesting memories. Um, and they were wondering how you use that as a work platform. Right. And I'm going to tell you, I'm such a pack rat. I still have, well, you can't quite see. This, these are the labels that you would use on them because they work really well on file folders. <laughs> and we had a lot of them. So um, we used basic um, mathematical calculations for um, line of sight paths. And if you recall, and it's still in there in the FCC forms, you would do eight cardinal radials. So you would take out your paper seven and a half minute map and you would get your two to 10 points, average it out. And then we had just short little programs that would um, calculate your FCC contours. And we also did uh, what now would be called RF safety or NIR studies because the state of Massachusetts required those studies even then. So the FCC didn't start looking at that or requiring that till 1996, but the state of Massachusetts Department of Health required that for all the radio sites even back then. Very cool. Now, Barney, a uh, question for Margaret. Uh, one popped up. What obstacles did you encounter as a woman in the field? Yeah, I'm not aware of what obstacles I had and, and overcame. Um, whether it was in high school, I guess right even that choice. I had gone to Catholic grammar school and I then switched to public school because at that time, the local Catholic high school was split boys and girls and Girls weren't taught calculus, as <laughs> crazy as that would seem. You had to get special permission to don't mm -hmm. take the classes with the boys. And that seemed ridiculous. So I was able, you know, to get my, and my sisters helped, you know, work my parents that I could go to the public school and really get the background that was appropriate for me for what I could do in college. And that also helped me get scholarships. My older sister 
was valedictorian at that Catholic school, got not one scholarship. You know? Yeah. 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 That, was, that turned out to be a great move, you know, yeah. to, to make that change. Uh, Scott, I, I saw a uh, chat uh, roll by on a co-worker with uh, Margaret. Can you... Uh... That is correct. Oh, my. Samuel. You know Samuel? He's, the, he's your design manager on the New York uh, uh, NYCT project. Okay, yes, and, yes. And, and he had some very nice complimentary stuff, and uh, her Thank attitude you. and cooperation <laughs> has made working with her and her team a pleasure. Ah, well, like and, and likewise, it's a good team there. Yes. That's all, always nice to hear good things. Yes. Another question, Scott. Yes. Um, so one of the attendees um, asked a question and said uh, um, that she is studying math and science, and she's thinking about pre-med and biochemistry. So she was wondering, what do you think the future of electrical engineering integrating with pre-med will be? Oh, I, I think there's a lot. Uh, coming down the, the pike for that. Uh, when you think of um, even what they have now with pills that you can take that are cameras and, and can do different things. So I think a lot of the pharma and the medicine and where you have wide area networks, body area networks, and um, all those kind of interesting Star trek -y type um, medical processes are really coming about. So I think there's there's a, a high correlation. When, when you think of, even as they figure out how to harvest energy for some of your wearables from through your skin, that takes both the electrical knowledge of how circuits and everything work and the medical knowledge of really what's going on at the cellular level in your body. So I, I see them coming together very well. Now, Barney, another question for Margaret. I uh, didn't see one pop up when I thought of one myself. Uh, going beyond the uh, correlation between electrical engineering and medical, what other specific fields could electrical engineering be applied to that might not be the normal directions? But can you think of other specialties or other directions that an electrical engineering degree could lead someone into? Whew, that's, I asked him to help me know what I should study <laughs> up on before tonight. Um, when you think in, in various sports areas, what, what the elite athletes do, whether it's to help with their training or even the sports equipment, or not even just the elite athletes, but what about um, like the Paralympics where people are differently abled and devices can help them perform in, in sports and in life? So those are some different areas. Again, that's still sticking kind of like a human interface. Um, invent something new, right? <laughs> there's always there's always that. Um, in the in the power fields, all the interesting things that are going on with um, autonomous vehicles. Whether I mean I'm communications based, but even just powering them and having them figure out uh, interactions with roads and and all that vehicles need to do. So that I, I could probably go a half an hour if you gave me time on all the different things engineering can, or electrical engineering can plug you into. And Scott, had another question for Margaret. I saw one pop in there. Yeah, um, actually we have a couple of them, um, but I'm going to go with one that I have actually. Um, where do you see the FCC going um, in terms of regulatory um, needs uh, you, you you alluded to the eight cardinal radials in in my past life uh, <laughs> li lived the joy of the cgsa for a long time um i was just curious if if you see any uh indication that the fcc is going to change how they're approaching any of this down the road with some of the new modeling technologies that are available and so forth um it's it's hard to know what the fcc is going to do um in in my span of my career you see the FCC more dominated by policy folks than engineers, which isn't necessarily bad. It is a policy-making organization, but you'd like to see engineers um, inform them more. Um, again, it, historically, they went for these not so much real world, but these two to 10 radials, 
with this idea that the spectrum belonged to people and they wanted the engineering of it to be able to be done by anybody, more or less, and not to, to really require anyone getting a license to hire someone such as me. So that's kind of some of the background. I've been very involved with the public safety communities as 800 and 700 megahertz became the place for those folks to build out, to really pack it in through APCO, they formed regions and really set up rules for extra engineering that had to be done. And that starts to use more modern takes on how to do predictability so you can see that the systems don't interfere with each other. Now, when you look at common carriers and everything that's going on 5G and whatnot, really the FCC says, here's your spectrum, you go use it. And they're not doing so much of the, that kind of technical there. And that's a technology change. I, I think FCC, even in some of the changes that are going on right now, um, they're moving. When I say right now, I mean at the for the cars, they just said, we're not going to do DSRC. We're going to use the more cellular and Wi-Fi talking to the cars. So they're really watching what technology is doing. And, and again, that's maybe because they're policymakers saying we got to make the policy match what people can do. Arnie, another question from Margaret. Oh, I'm going to try to combine two questions here because one sort of uh, comes very close to me. Uh, the, the, the initial question is what would you, uh, for a new college graduate, uh, choices, do you do go on to graduate school, maybe go to law school even uh, because of the demand or would you start with a small company or a large company if you want to stay in the engineering field? Okay, um, if I was at that stage in life, when I look at what people are asking for in, in uh, what's your background, to stay in school to do a master of science in electrical engineering or whatever the other field is, that seems to be required more now. There is so much more to learn than there was 30 years ago that, um, it really seems that that is very helpful in having the, the technical background to do more engineering. And um, when I look out there at, at different degree programs, you're seeing master's degrees on campus having focuses as much preparing you to go to industry as to prepare you to stay in academia. Because back when I was an undergrad, if you stayed in school, you were on an academic path and maybe you'd wind up out in the public or private sector, but that was more rare. Um, you're a lawyer, so yeah, you might recommend going to law school. I can't imagine why. <laughs> it's, not so, a bad, it's not a bad education. <laughs> no, it's not. Actually, I'm always amazed when I, the, the good lawyers I work with, you know, they'll pick my brain for what technical knowledge they need, and they can turn around and speak about it like they've studied it for 10 years. I'm like, how do you do that out of a five-minute conversation? So really, I'm impressed. At, at what lawyers are able to do in that way. Uh, Scott, another question for Margaret. Right, from um, also from Samuel, he was asking if you see the 2012 congressional mandate going away. I do, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> he asked, because we have a project that is related to that mandate. <laughs> so I bite my fingernails about that because that mandate is really required that we do a project, the mandate goes away. I don't know if his agency, which is a little underfunded right now, thanks to COVID keeping people away from transit, you know. So uh, Margaret, you recently uh, picked up another, uh, another thing that you do. I don't, I, I don't think you could call this a hobby, but tell us about the work you're doing with accreditation for, uh, for colleges. Right, so um, in 2019, I became a program evaluator for ABET, which is one of those organizations that only goes by ABET now, but the letters originally came from Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. It's a federation of um, professional and technical societies that develop the standards of quality for engineering degrees. And what do you know? I might have heard about them before. If you remember my Scranton to Purdue story, I, I early on learned about you want to have this accredited degree to help 
kind of grease the wheels further in your um, in your process. And by the way, because you know, uh, Dr. Frizzell was just a speaker. Since the 80s, Scranton has become accredited. <laughs> it, it, it's not like, oh, it's this backwater school. At that time, they weren't. It is a process. They thought they would have it. By the time I graduated, it, it was probably close to 10 years later. But um, so yeah, I always had that interest to know what does it take for a program to be accredited? I followed it along and I got to a point in my career that I could take the time to do that because when you don't have a pandemic, you spend a week on campus uh, doing this evaluation, which means you're not at work. So you have to be far enough in your career that you can just take off a week when the IEEE and ABET say, now you need to go. So you've done a, a remote accreditation uh, recently. Yes, yes. So I did my, uh, we did an accreditation of a program in upstate New York um, earlier this fall. It was all virtual because of the pandemic. And, you know, ABET is really a wonderful organization. It is ISO 9001 certified. It's a quality process. And it turns out a couple years back, they ran it to a situation where it was unsafe for the team from the U.S. to travel to a Middle Eastern country to do the evaluation. There was a local coup. It was just unsafe. So they had figured out how to do a remote um, evaluation. And so they only sent two people to that country and everyone else was at ABET headquarters in Baltimore as a team together. And what ABET did this year with the pandemic was take that model, which they already had, and expand it to say, we don't want you to come to Baltimore. You're all going to do it individually from your homes. So the downside is the team didn't get to, together any closer than we are right now, but it's pretty good. It works. It's it worked out. That's great, yeah. and uh, that's uh, it's the new uh, the new world adapting. Yes, yes. <laughs> Barney, uh, another question for Margaret. Another uh, question popped up. The radio engineering community uh, is quite small circle. Uh, you are one of the few in the exclusive area. How would you encourage young people, or especially women, to get into the wireless field? Yes, please, um, because real knowledge of RF is so important. It's not, when you see people building Wi-Fi systems, the ones who don't have RF knowledge, it's a wing and a prayer. <laughs> and uh, they don't always understand where they're running into trouble. So, I mean, I'm going to rec recommend the way I did it. That's one way. You, you, you work at a small firm because you learn a lot. You have very good mentorship. And in a small firm, you're dumped in quickly. The other way is to work for one of the major uh, manufacturers of systems and equipment. So in the public safety field, that's Motorola, Tate, Harris, um, bigger than that, you've got Ericsson and Nokia. And as you work with those folks, that's almost, I used to call that the graduate way of, of getting a radio education. You know, you, you'll learn it from a different angle, but you really get in deep of how this RF stuff works and how the uh, the piece parts interplay, whether it's the radio in your hand or the one up at the tower, and how do you combine all these frequencies? So uh, we're on here tonight. This is the Radio Club of America interview series, and uh, we're on with Margaret Lyons, PE, and she is uh, based in New Jersey. Uh, you can find out more information about uh, future interview series and our, our members-only networking events by going to the radioclubofamerica.org website, and it's radioclubofamerica, all one word, .org, and you can get, uh, there are recordings there of the technical symposium and our, our recent awards banquet, as well as um, previous interview series uh, that we've had here as uh, part of uh, the year 2020. Uh, let's go back down to uh, Scott. Uh, another question for Margaret. Right. <clears throat> hey, Margaret, I was curious if you had any uh, insight or input or ideas relative to FirstNet um, and just any thoughts about that. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, so FirstNet is a great idea. 
it came from the right place, right? For those who don't know, FirstNet, it came about after the events of 9-11, where the 9-11 Commission said one of the issues that went on in the response was a lack of uh, connecting the dots and some intercommunication between the first responder agencies. And, and so it says, you know, the important, there's an importance now of how do we get everyone to be able to talk to each other? And through the efforts of a lot of people, Spectrum was set aside to build a, a network that would be interoperable for any of the first responders across the country and be able to push data, to be a rather data intensive. Um, as it's evolved, um, AT&T has the contract, I may not use the words right, and they have built out FirstNet. Um, I actually, in the New York metro area, I hear daily advertisements on the radio for FirstNet. I, I'm amazed because this is my field and <laughs> how does this happen? Um, so that's that part of it. I, I look at the evenness of its build out and you know, right now where it's like a build out of a cellular system where it's good, it's very good. And where it misses, it's missing. So how do we appropriately overlay private systems in FirstNet? That's the trick right now. And also from a funding standpoint, as, as FirstNet becomes more and more successful, I perceive that it's, it's starving money from private systems, which still have a place. So that's, that's, I guess there's a political side, how it can all fit together, how we can learn from each other, the, the two types of systems and how they can really mesh together to provide a full blanket solution. Great, thank, thank you, Margaret. Uh, Barney, another question. Uh, I thought, I see one popped up here, but I thought of one myself. Um, given you your involvement in the RF engineering field over as it has grown, do you have any predictions of what we're going to, if we're going to see anything different in the next five years or 10 years? Um, undoubtedly. What that will be, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, there are so many creative people. Uh, again, locally in New Jersey with my IEEE group, I, I get to interact with people who are at what used to be Bell Labs or maybe still is called Bell Labs, not coming from that that group myself, I'm never quite sure how to, how to label it, but they're still out there inventing the new things and inventing, you know, beyond radio and, and doing communications into the optics, but even over the air optics, not just in, in a light. So while those folks are inventing new things, then there's other people making use of it and saying, here's how we're gonna build a new system. So undoubtedly five, 10, 20 years, we're gonna see changes again, like we've have seen the past 20 and that's exciting 6g 7g here we go right, right. <laughs> uh scott another question for margaret yeah you alluded to earlier to uh, massachusetts having some rf safety rules in place much earlier than many other places um, yes. i was curious if there were any uh, if what your thoughts are on the current state of the rf safety protocols the and and when where that the future may lie in in that from a regulatory perspective and just from a um, an engineering perspective um I, i'm i'm pretty comfortable with where it is now um i i have had a, a career-long exposure if you want to use that word to this topic uh right from the get-go that was one of the early things they had the junior engineer do is is run those programs they are pretty straightforward uh math percentages type programs. And I was very curious about that. And again, I was set up to be the programmer for engineering tools. So I got to really dig into where did this protocol come from? What's the Massachusetts? What's ANSI? What's OSHA? And somewhere along the line, I actually started working on a master's degree at Rutgers and out of, out of a uh, out of degree topic or out of the main double E topic, I took a class over in the radiation sciences department at Rutgers to actually learn more about what is this stuff that Massachusetts is asking about. And the professor was actually someone who was on the committee 
at the IEEE who was updating the standard, which has become the one that the FCC uses today. So I, I, I got an early view of that and learned a lot about that and a lot of what made them decide the numbers that are in there. So I'm really quite comfortable with it. And as we move to 5G, 6G and higher and higher frequencies, um, it impacts less. The higher frequencies, as us radio folks know, you have a skin effect. It, it impacts whether it's your, your copper cable or your skin and bones, it, it penetrates less. So as we go to higher and higher frequencies, I know people in the world are scared. It's actually going to impact you even less. So I'm, I'm good. Speaking of uh, network quality, um, uh, Scott, did you, uh, did you detect a, uh, a bad handoff for Margaret there? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> your your audio suddenly uh, became very narrow band. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm losing. We switched unexpectedly to my cell phone. I didn't have it fully charged. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not in a room with my charger. <laughs> <laughs> but your audio's back. You got a good handoff now. Oh, good. Uh, okay. <laughs> so your audio is uh, is doing well. Yeah, uh, I, I did help Verizon zone a tower right up the street from me. And when they built it, I looked at it. It's beautiful. Look at it bleeding the sun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and a lot of people say, I want great coverage, but don't you dare put it in my backyard. <laughs> but I used you're, to have you're terrible a... coverage, and, and zoning people would say, Would you want that in, in front of your house? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't, don't ask me that question because you're not going to like the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, Barney, how, how about a last question for Margaret? I, I, with that comment about not in my backyard, because I had a recent experience on our local planning commission, I, I, could, I could say a little bit more about that and people uh, not wanting them in your back tower and uh, viewpoints of what people think about towers. Uh, but I'll, I'll go to this other one about, uh, do you have any comments about technologies from other countries? Are there any countries that are doing well or maybe even better than we, we are in advancing uh, wireless technology? Uh, I, I'm not in particularly up to speed on that. Again, when you look at the manufacturers of, of everything that's available, they are international companies. So it, it, it tends to be what frequency bands are allowed in what countries and things are adapted, but I don't have a good sense of pick a country, they've leapfrogged us in some way or another. That does tend to happen, right? You have a base of one thing, when the next one comes along, you have to merge yourself, but if you never had this one, you can jump right into the next. So here and there, there is some leapfrogging and that's just always gonna be the way. Okay, and Scott, a, a last question for Margaret. All right. Well, that's good because there's uh, one remaining question, so we will ask it. Um, landline phones have already got replaced by the smartphone. So the question is, when do you foresee the 5G and greater wireless experiences replacing the remaining wired connections that we currently use, maybe for cable modems uh, or for other uh, wired connections for the Internet and so forth? Ooh. Um it's going to it's going to start in in the the big heavy metro areas first that's you know we we talk about these things and i, I live in a suburban area between new york and philadelphia in a hotbed of technology we're going to see it here but in rural america it's going to be probably more satellite derived than 5g derived so it really depends on where you are what technology is going to get you out of being plugged in um economics and and service here in my area one provider is derided for how awful their service is i'm not going to name names and then people even on a conference call say margaret you got to get rid of that pro provider go to this other one and that's going to push people too it's if your local provider of the older type service isn't doing a good job people are going to toss them if they continue to do a good job and do it for a, a, a good value, people are going to stick with them, inertia and finances. Well, uh, Margaret, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming on. And I want to thank all of our viewers, our participants, everybody that asked questions. 
And uh, please go to the radioclubofamerica.org website to find out more information about this exciting club uh, that uh, is very vibrant. Uh, we've got a, a lot of great value. Uh, again, January 12th, it's a members only networking uh, Zoom session. It's not a Zoom webinar, it's a full Zoom session. And uh, we had one uh, uh, two months ago and it was great, absolutely fabulous. And so uh, I wanna invite all the members to participate. And if you're not a member, join up so yeah. that you can participate in that call. And then February 9th will be our next interview uh, series and that will be John Fasella, who is the incoming president of the Radio Club of America. And I wanna thank our, our two moderators, Scott Jones and Barney Scholl for their help uh, tonight. And uh, we wanna wish everybody a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you again, Margaret, for coming on tonight. Happy to be here, you do a great job. Thank you. And uh, best wishes to everybody and a good evening.